Big love, everybody. Much respect. So today's work will be uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, as usual. Uh, all honor to those who came before. Dylan Sokoshio and Chance Gordon brought this together on the Innerverse podcast. And you will find links to that show uh, in my show notes below. Uh, essentially, Chance was uh, giving Dylan much, much landing space to bring down the uh, greatest components of the greatest story ever told and putting, putting a massive decode together for all of us to uh, lift our awareness and uh, enhance our symbolic literacy in a major way. So I want to give all respect to those two brothers uh, in the show that they did together. It was a very hot and uh, uh, valuable uh, message that they brought forward. So here I want to show a close-up of the Wheel of Fortune which is card number 10. And you will see the what we will be focusing on in this video uh, f to start us off will be these four corners. You see there are, uh, there's a, a bull, a vaca, there's a lion, there's a, uh, a f eagle, and an angel, or sometimes uh, simply a man. All of them are reading they are reading the books, and those books that they are reading are uh, very, very significant, as I will indicate as we go forward. We will decipher how those books... B-O-O-K, how that becomes... The K O O B, the cube. We are all worshiping the cube. It doesn't matter which branch of Abrahamic inclination you subscribe to, you are all under the influence of the cube. And the wisdom of the elders uh, is undeniable. It's undeniable. You know, you can run, but you can't hide. Uh, <laughs> you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. <laughs> and that's the truth. So while we're here, let's learn the signs and symbols, you know. Let's master the system that we are all working under uh, and lift up our symbolic literacy to the max. So big up to our brothers, Dylan and Chance. Much love for bringing this forward. I'm going to give it some visual substantiation and do just a little bit of uh, incorporating it into my tarot tories. So uh, we will start at the beginning. Uh, so these four stars are the royal stars. They are the fixed signs of the zodiac. And... Um, if you don't understand fixed, cardinal, and mutable, uh, then you have some reviewing to do. But these four corners of the circle are fixed signs. And uh, we are giving more uh, validity, more substance to that fact that they are fixed. These, uh, this is the course of the fiction. And that is what they are reading. They are reading novels. They are reading the cube of the good book. And we are all part of this story. So let's get active about it, right? So we're going to start with, um, essentially, this is a, if you have not seen their show, go stop everything right now. Go back and watch their show. You got about an hour and a half, maybe two hours of catching up to do. But these four Corners, these four stars, represent the name of the God of the Jews, yod heh bav heh 
and I will uh, go over these in that order. We will start with uh, Aquarius, we will move to Scorpio, then to Taurus, and then finish off on Leo. And you will see this is the name of the Jews, the God of the Jews. It makes the shape of a man, and its name is encoded in these four corners of the uh, of the fixed signs, the royal stars of the heavens. <clears throat> so beginning with Fomal Haut, Formal H A U T, F O M A L H A U T. This star is uh, found in this quadrant of the sky. It is um, essentially the uh, the star of Aquarius. It is the fish into which um, the water bearer is pouring the water into the mouth of this fish. And so uh, the water bearer represents John the Baptist. And the fish who is drinking the wisdom, drinking the gnosis that is pouring out of the water pitcher, out of the jug, uh, which reminds me of the word, the word, the gnosis from the jug reminds me very much of a very similar sounding word, the gnosis of Jung, Carl Jung. And that jug has much, much subconscious uh, value as does the knowledge of understanding Carl Jung. But uh, the fish is drinking the water that is poured out by John the Baptist, the water bearer. And that fish is the fish-headed crown of the Pope. And so the word Yod in the Hebrew alphabet, it means hand. But I will uh, put forth that in the context of this yod heh bav -He, Yod the hand is the head of the character of the God of the Hebrews. And there are many uh, other symbols and signs that are uh, uh, associated with Fomal Haut. And that is essentially what we're doing here today. So we are talking about this eagle in this corner. Um, and it also it is, uh, represents the God uh, Joannes. It represents John the Baptist. It is in the uh, the minor decand of uh, of Aquarius. There is another constellation in that quadrant called the Akira, or Akia, which is uh, <laughs> much like Akia, A K I A. So the Akia, A Q U I L L A, is an eagle symbol in the heavens. And, uh, and it definitely represents the Yod of the beginning of the name of the Jews, the God of the Jews. If you look this up, uh, we are going to be uh, tapping into some Wikipedia and some NASA information. So take it for what it's worth. These things are uh, standards. They are fundamental truths. Uh, it is uh, very hard to lie about them. And if you don't trust these sources, get out there, get your telescope, figure it out for yourself. Uh, but these are some of the facts that I was able to uh, build in support of what uh, Dylan and Chance gave us in their, uh, in their efforts previously on the Interverse podcast. So uh, Wikipedia will tell you that uh, Formal Haut is uh, fictionalized often and is said to be where the Great Eye of Sauron comes from. And if I can splice in this image right now, I will try to put this, uh, this capture of the appearance of an eyeball in the sky, in this location. And uh, a lot of folks will recognize it from the Lord of the Rings storyline. Um, also, uh, Oannes is the uh, fish god. It's also... Uh, considered uh, to be the uh, the fish that is drinking the gnosis that was poured out by the uh, water bearer, um, and it is said to have drank up the deluge from the uh, from the days when the uh, Noah's flood occurred, 
Uh, there are some cultures that believe that this particular fish, uh, this fish god, drank the water so that the land could rise again. Uh, it is said to be, to also, this star represents Typhon. And Typhon is part of Greek mythology. Uh, when a horrible conflagration occurred and the uh, nine gods of the Greek pantheon, they uh, ran away to Egypt and they hid in Egypt under the disguise of uh, animal masks so that Typhon would walk across the land and not recognize them. And it is said that uh, as, it, as Typhon passed unaware through the land of Egypt, that Zeus then jumped up and attacked Typhon from behind. And a battle ensued. Zeus was uh, overthrown. His tendons were extracted. And he was uh, uh, taken to, I believe, the island of Crete and uh, laid there for many, uh, for a long period of time, uh, imp com rendered impotent. And it was, I believe... Hermes and Pan, who tracked Typhon down and saved Zeus and brought order back to the land. But the body of Typhon, ultimately, after losing to Zeus on the second round, the body of Typhon is hidden under Mount Etna. And that is very profound to me, as Mount Etna is known to be one of the volcanoes that erupted exactly on cue right in sync with Vulcanalia around uh, August 27th on the on that very fateful year. So it's very profound, profound that Typhon uh, is said to be buried under Mount Etna. Etna had an eruption right on the markation of Vulcanalia, which is here at the X marks the spot of the Analima. Um, Mount Etna, Mount Krakatoa, and Pompeii all erupted right there on the holiday of Vulcanalia, honoring the god of the volcanoes. So also I will point out that Typhon is uh, the two fingers of the peace sign, which was handed as a mudra from Crowley to um, Winston Churchill. And he handed this uh, hand mudra to Churchill to go and do battle against uh, the swastika. And so the Typhon versus the swastika could be interpreted as Typhon versus Zeus. Uh, but that's a whole nother story for another time. We're getting off track. So another name for uh, Fomal Hout is the fish god dragon. And that is very profound to me. It is, seems to be an, an amalgamation of all three uh, constellations in this quadrant as uh, the Jewish Capricorn symbol in their zodiac is a goat-headed uh, fish. So it could be considered a fish god dragon as it has horns and a tail of a fish. So uh, in the Arabian mythology, it is called the first frog, which is quite interesting to me that um, January is very... Uh, interested in first offerings, first fruits. So calling it the first frog, you know, that first jump across to a new beginning. Um, some people will uh, make an offering to Oannes by bringing fruit to the, uh, up to the sand of the sea and leave the fruit there in, in exchange for a, uh, a wish to come true. And they will leave and come back the next day. The fruit will have been taken away by the tide, indicating that Oannes has accepted their offer. And then they can look forward to their wish coming true. So Fomal Halt could be considered the wish-fulfilling star. Um, it is called the loneliest star. As uh, if I am fortunate enough to bring forth that image of the eye of Sauron, you will see that there is a bit of a clearing, a clear space around Fomal Hout, uh, giving it a sense of independence, of one being alone, uh, an, an one L, uh, one God, one, one light in and of itself, uh, alone in the heavens. So uh, hopefully I can bring that image forward to make more sense of that. 
And according to uh, many sources, NASA included, uh, it is actually not a star. It is an expanding dust, dust disk, a disk of dust that is expanding, which indicates that Fomalhaut might have uh, experienced a conflagration. It may, may have supernova and uh, it may have had a chain reaction uh, lending to a revelation period on Earth. Um, uh, there is a whole other video to be made on that idea. But the fact that it is uh, associated with the drinking of the deluge, the fish god, the typhon, these stories of calamity, uh, and the fact that when we look closely at that star, it appears to have exploded and now is uh, essentially a ring of dust. Um, it is the third brightest star in the heavens, the sun being the first, uh, Pollock being the second, uh, which I believe is up here in the uh, between Cancer and Gemini. Um, but it is the third brightest star, and it's down here in this beginning of the uh, standard uh, traditional calendar. And uh, also legend has it that... Uh, 2,500 years ago, it would have mar been the markation point for the solstice. And so it has experienced uh, parallax, but just took 2,500 years for that parallax to be perceivable. And one item I did not write in here is that it has uh, a correlation to the Elysian Mysteries and uh, Demeter uh, ha has a uh, a connection to Demeter, uh, which again has a very profound relationship to this solstice location. So some of its myth is out of date. It's out of alignment because of uh, cosmic parallax in the great year. So moving forward from the Yod, our next uh, step inward is the Antares. We are moving into the He, Yod, He. And Antares is called is uh, symbolized here by the man or the angel, you could say. And uh, that angel is a representation of Scorpi. That star Antares is in Scorpius. It is uh, symbolic of Saint Matthew. And so when you are reading the book of Matthew, uh, you are dealing with the paradigm of this quadrant of the fixed royal stars, Antares, in the sign of Scorpion, uh, Scorpio. Now, in Egypt, uh, Antares is uh, referred to as the neglected twin of Betelgeuse. And I find that quite interesting. Uh, that we can probably go through and uh, find some signs and symbols in uh, in Shakespeare, in Hollywood, in you know the Actors Guild, where a neglected twin of Beetlejuice uh, has been flashed before your eyes to indicate the Scorpion, Gospel of Matthew, and the Antares significance. Um, Beetlejuice is the upper shoulder of Ophiuchus, so this being a neglected twin uh, is uh, probably uh, been indicated in many stories and myths um, in the past. So it's also uh, referred to as the RHO, the Ro Ophiuchi cloud. Um, it is the breast of Ishara, Ishara. And one thing that I found interesting is that I believe it was in uh, some Western culture, excuse me, Eastern culture. Uh, that October, this area of the season, is uh, called Quito Yao. And that is a interesting reference to the path of Aldebaran. And that draws this line across to our next corner, our next quadrant. And that little indication that October is the path of Aldebaran. Uh, it is because uh, as the as the season as the um, 
the horizon line is twisting through these signs in the heavens, uh, there is that law of correspondence. You will have Antares on one side and Aldebaran will be on the other. If these were scales, then Regulus and Formal Hout would be opposing scales, one holding one dish, one holding the other. And as that season twists, Antares has correspondence to Aldebaran. <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, I think... Uh, I think we have some unscrambling of these quadrants. The reason why they're not in the uh, projected location that they would be on the ground, if you're looking down at this card, uh, you would have to look to the heavens to decode uh, why these quadrants are scrambled in the Wheel of Fortune card. So uh, this is the He of the Yod He. Now we're moving to the Bav. Yod He Bav which is Aldebaran, the bull's eye. Luke, Luke, eye, Luke with your eye. Uh, the book of Luke is uh, written in the context of this Aldebaran, this sp uh, spring season, this rising of the sun uh, through, the, through the year. It is in the sign of Taurus, the bull, and I think that is very interesting that the B-U-L is symbol, symbolic of the B-A-V. Um, in Greek, it is called uh, Lampadias, which is the torch bearer. Um, it's also the torch carrier. Um, you know, we have that uh, f the light bearer, the, <laughs> the Lucifer, um, and this Taurus has those horns, uh, much like... Uh, Moses, when he came down from the mountain with the light shining off of his head, uh, much like horns coming off of his head. Um, and we are on coming, uh, we're on the mountain, we're on the hill, we're coming off the precipice. In the cosmic year, we would be coming down the hill. In the standard year, we're going up the hill. Um, so, uh, I think it is in Greek that this sign is called Theta Tauri, T-H-E-T-A-T-A-U-R-I. Um, so that's your, there's your uh, two T's. But in Chinese, it is called the fifth star of the net. And that is quite interesting uh, as <clears throat> it is uh, sign number five. If we count... This is our first of the year, the beginning of the year, right there in Capricorn. Uh, we get the one, two, three, four, five. Taurus lands on the fifth month. And net becomes very interesting as net is 10 in reverse. So I find that quite profound. Uh, net is 10, and the Wheel of Fortune is card number 10. Um, also, also uh, according to NASA, so take it for what it's worth here, the Pioneer 10 space probe, Pioneer X, that space probe is uh, flying towards Aldebaran. And in 2 million years, it's going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so silly. It's so silly. But the signs and symbols have consistency. So there is value in that. So <clears throat> also Aldebaran was proposed to be the name for a, um, a element of the periodic table, which is uh, Yibberite, uh, Y-B-B, E R I T E, Yubiterite, which has a, a atomic number of 70. Uh, but I just find it quite interesting that they were going to put one of the royal stars in uh, this position on the uh, on the elemental, uh, the periodic table of elements. Um, so YB could very easily uh, be a representation of Aldebaran for those in the know. And it's uh, just very interesting that we have a Y and a B uh, kind of 
building on the Yod He Bav. Yod He Bav. And it is the Yibberite. And so uh, another name for Aldebaran is the Red One uh, in Hindu mythology. Uh, as that is one of the eyes of the bull. Um, and I will also uh, just kind of put this on the table on this uh, at this juncture that uh, Ross Ben has some evidence that the signing of the Declaration of Independence it was actually initiated the night before the gentlemen came together in Parliament to sign on that declaration. And that Benjamin Franklin had uh, had collected a few gentlemen in the catacombs beneath, beneath the building and had initiated the birth of this nation under the sign of Aldebaran and not under the sign that the public is led to believe, such that anybody who wants to do the star chart of this country, if they go by the public uh, perspective, in the public, publicly presented time frame, they will get a bad calendar. And uh, Ross Ben has much to say about how doing uh, the star chart of this country under the sign of Aldebaran will give you a much more accurate understanding of uh, why the country is in the state of being that it is, uh, having much more accuracy uh, to the path that this country has taken. So finishing off here on Regulus, I want to uh, point out, as I've said before, uh, this is considered the lion's heart. And many cultures refer to this as the lion's heart. <clears throat> and I'm just going to leave that there. But if you've seen my work in the past, I don't think it's the heart. Uh, I think it is in the, uh, it's under the tail. <laughs> I don't think it's in the heart. I think that, uh, let's see if I can do this. Leo is a triangle here, a square here, and a hook right here. And they're telling you that the head of the lion is up here. But where I think that's the tail. And uh, this regulus is right here in this little corner here in that bottom right corner. But I don't think that's the tail. I don't think that's the heart. I think we're looking at the ass of the cat. But I'm going to leave that alone because uh, I've already gone over that subject. So Regulus is, uh, biblically, is in the the Gospel of Mark. And it is the hay, the final, the footing, the foundation, the feet, the starting point, uh, the initiates, uh, the bottom, the building block, bottom building block of the name of the God of the Jews. <clears throat> and it is in that shape of a tav, which is the sign for pi. But it represents the he, the last syllable of the name of the God of the Jews. It is in Greek referred to as Alpha Leonis. It is 79 light years away. I find that quite uh, fortuitous as 79 is the atomic number for gold. The lion is gold, um, and it is a quadruple star system, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, there's probably much more to be said about that, uh, but I just found it very interesting that it is uh, has quadru a quadruple uh, star uh, significance. It's sometimes referred to as the sickle. As we pointed out, this tail, this hooking tail, is sometimes referred to as the sickle. In Greek, it is called the basilis, basiliscus. Basiliscus. Uh, and here we have the word basil, which is uh, no small uh, fact. But the basilicus of the uh, Church of Rome, of the Vatican, the Basilicus. Uh, that's a very interesting um, uh, structure. And, uh, you know, they probably have some cosmic alignment to Leo. I did not actually substantiate that, but I'm, it's pretty safe to say it uh, sounds like, is like, relates to, uh, probably comes into play right there. In Arabic, it is called the Qalib Af Asad. 
excuse me, Qualib al-Assad. And in Chinese, it is called the Yellow Emperor. In Babylonian, it is called the Shara and the Lugal. Uh, those are both names for this baby lion, this little, this prince, the uh, royal symbol of, uh, of, you know, the days of worshiping the cat as the royal house. So those are the four royal stars. And what I'm going to do is uh, I will point out, as I've pointed out in the past, why they are all reading the cube, the book. They are all reading the four corners of the, good, of the book, all of them, in the Wheel of Fortune card. And I'm going to point this fact out right now. Fortune. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10. 4, 10. This is the wheel of 4, 10. Wheel of 4, 10. The 4 becomes 10. Sorry about my chicken scratch there. But now things should make a little more sense. And I've done this before, but you, just so people don't have to go back and dig. Every month, uh, the months run, uh, if anybody's ever done the knuckle count for January, February, March, April, May, June, July, you will remember that months go from long to short to long to short to long to short alternating. And by doing that, you can glean a very fascinating shape. You get the hexagon of the of the six sides of the cube um, and that is the reason why I drew the shape on the inner circle here and from there a very important symbol is required to generate this image of the canted square to bring it to life to give it three-dimensional substance and that shape that is required to give the hexagram life to bring it into the third dimension from the second dimension, two-dimensional paperwork into three-dimensional reality, the shape required is the yod. This Y is the yod. And um, from here, I want to uh, step into an alternate calendar system. We're going to leave the 12 months of the year behind. We're going to hold on to with our hand. We're going to grasp on to the yod. And we're going to do a new calendar in my next video, uh, one that very few people uh, are familiar with, and it has uh, much uh, relationship to the Enneagram, and I will be leaning into um, uh, the work of one of our elders, um, who goes by the name of Levette. Uh, sorry about the hesitation. Levette is one of the greats. Uh, one of the greatest there is. So before I step away from this entire symbol and the wheel of 410, the wheel of 4 becoming the 10, um, I want to point out that there is a yod, a very important yod in the territories of America. And I'm going to bring everybody in for a little glimpse of what I'm talking about. Here's a closer look at my notes. Moving to the Antares, to the Aldebaran, and to Regulus, yod heh bav -Hey. there's the Yod, and right there at the nexus point of the entire United States, at the foot of, the, uh, of Illinois, is where the Mississippi generates a Yod. And I do believe that that is something of an X marks the spot, the center point of the territories of this entire system of um, what my wonderful sister Rachel has brought to light has been called for years astrocartography. And so what I've been calling the territories may have uh, more revelation if we look at it in the context of astrocartography. Uh, but I like the the word territories, as hokey as it is, uh, I think we're going to stick with it. So 
My next video will be working on this Yod Juncture at the, uh, the top of the Mississippi River and uh, relating it to an alternative calendar system that uh, may be in use in certain elite circles uh, that would lend more uh, pattern recognition if we just take a minute to acknowledge that it may be very, very valuable. Much love and respect, everybody. Hope you dug it. Peace and strength.